Hi, good morning. Uh, so my name is uh, David Follin, and I'm going to present how to explore the potential of Ignite using classless design. So this, uh, this talk was about the experience we had in, in ING. Uh, I work for ING Belgium. I'm a chapter lead. I'll explain a bit more what, what it means. Here, uh, that was an application that we created about two years ago or something, where we, um, add, we had this mission to protect our mainframe from a lot of concurrent call. So what we did is we put an Ignite cache, an Ignite cluster cache in front of it, so that all the clients, they would access the data using the cache and not accessing directly the, the mainframe. What we did is we had uh, different cluster groups, each cluster group shielding a different mainframe application. So we had, for instance, customer, customer mainframe, uh, we had transaction mainframe, so each time there was a cluster group in front of it. Then we had, on top of that, clients uh, that would access the data using Ignite services. So it was serving a lot of different applications, and the, uh, the caches were really allowed to, allow to have a lot of parallel concurrent call. To why we chose to invest, to invest in Ignite? Well, in-memory in computing is very promising. It's resilient, performance, scalable. It provides high availability and consistency of the data. However, Ignite showed some limitation when we tried to use it. Uh, first thing, we bet a lot on the service grid of Ignite, but this uh, service grid has very important issues. One of them being that when you update the code of a service, you, you need to take the full grid down and deploy the new version and then ta start the full grid up again. And that meant that, for instance, when you had two different applications, two different teams, we had to impact one team because another team wanted to deploy a new service. And that wasn't acceptable. Also, the services, they have some issues with the life cycle. So you could potentially call a service even before it was deployed. So when we had a client trying to hammer the, the grid when the grid was back up, so you had this notion, the, the, the event that the grid was up, but the service were not up yet. So there was a lot of call from the clients that ended up in error because the, the service was not up. And so as you understood, in terms of multi-tenancy, we had issues as well because first, yeah, we impacted the different application by uh, deploying a new, uh, only one of them. But also in Ignite, what happens is when you have a cache configuration, it's spread around all the nodes of the cluster, server node and client nodes. And that's quite, uh, it's quite hampering our, our work because it happens that if one team chooses to have its cluster backed by, for instance, Oracle or another one use uh, Cassandra as a data store, what happens is if there's a mismatch in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, library is being used for the, the, the storage because, for instance, when you said you want to store something with Cassandra, you need to provide the, the name of the Cassandra driver. If the other one didn't have that in its class path, then you had a problem of conflict, uh, you had a conflict and potentially the node didn't start because of that. So that was very, uh, very important and it really, uh, it really gave us a lot of troubles. So why did I do this talk? Uh, first, this uh, ING, we have nice uh, uh, promises, but one of them is anytime. So we promise to a customer will be there anytime. And having to take the cluster down because we need to do an update, that's breaking a promise. Then, as I said, I'm a chapter lead. A chapter lead is a role in ING where uh, I do half of my time as a developer and half of the time as a manager. Uh, as a manager, I do, yeah, basic administrative stuff, but my in most important task is to improve the knowledge of the team. And to do that, we have different workshops. And one of these workshops is actually the subject of this talk. We decided to explore the different possibilities we could have with classless design. So what we're going to talk about today is, first, we're going to have an application. We're going to define requirements for this application. We're going to come up with a design. And then also, we'll have to introduce changes later on, to simulate the life cycle of an application. We have a life cycle, we, we have an application, needs, we build it, we put it in production, and then we need to update it. Well, 
being a bank, let's talk about a payment application. We're good at that. Uh, we'll have three requirements. Uh, a user can get the list of the account and the balances. Uh, it can get the list of the transaction on a given account. Uh, it can initiate a debit, so removing money from the account. And when initiating a debit, we will have these business rules. The currency has to be the same, and the amount has to be lower equal than the account balance, so that it doesn't go negative. For the sake of the simplicity, I'll focus on the back end. We'll expose the REST API, and we won't go into uh, security and things like that. The architecture that we explored is the following. So uh, we would have a NIGNA cluster of server nodes that would be vanilla server nodes. So no, app, no, apps, uh, no jar deployed on them except Ignite jar. So nothing specific that for the application. So the, the nodes will start in the same cluster. They will have Ignite persistence enabled, but nothing specific, nothing from the application. And then we would have a Spring Boot application starting a client node that would connect to this cluster. That helps us to have a stable server topology because when you have a data grid, you want the servers to, you want the, the server nodes to be as stable as possible because as soon as you remove or add servers, you have a rebalancing of data and when you have tons of data, it's, it can take time and can lead to issues. So here we want to stabilize the uh, topology of our server nodes as much as possible. And then having that also helps us to scale the different layers differently. So if we see that we have a lot of concurrent call on the API layer, we can start up new uh, boot, uh, Spring Boot services. Whereas if we see that we're getting to a high amount of usage of the RAM, we can potentially add a new node. Uh, then, quickly, we, to, ignite, to uh, maintain the, the, those caches, we have a small Java client that would just start, send a, send a command, and then stop. So for instance, when we want to create a cache, the client starts, sends the create cache to the Ignite cluster, and then shuts down once it's done. Uh, it's a Java application, simple. We, yeah, we can update indexes as well if you want. It's really like a client to a database, I would say. So the model, let's have a simple model, a simple customer, first name, last name, has accounts, and an account you can have transactions. So the cache needs to be transactional on the account and the transaction because we need to make sure that when we store the transaction, we also debit the account or change the balance appropriately in the same transaction so that we don't have any inconsistent state. Um, now I'm going to do a side uh, talk. It's about collocation. Uh, when using Ignite, something which is really useful, I find, is the notion of collocation. So, if you don't have any collocation, what happens is, let's say you have those, this, this configuration. You have the account cache, you have three nodes, and you have first account on node one, and so on and so forth. If you don't set up any special uh, collocation uh, routine, what happens is you could have the transaction of a given account being spread around the whole cluster. And when you want to do operation, that can be annoying because then there will be a lot of chatter around the different nodes. So what you want to have is collocation setup. Here, for instance, on a, for the account one, I know that all the transactions of the first account will stay on the same server node. Therefore, we can have affinity execution. Affinity execution is, for instance, I have this client, and I want to execute the code with where the data is. And that's an important aspect of Ignite, is the notion of affinity execution. I want to send the task to execute to the node where the data is. I don't want to get from the, the node all the information. So we will minimize the round trip in terms of uh, communication between the different nodes. So let's say I want to calculate the average amount of a transaction for a given account. Let's say account one. So I prepare this compute task. I will send it. Because we know that it's for account one, Ignite will be able to say, OK, this task is for account one. I know that account one maps to server node one. So it will send the compute task to the first server node. Then here, no need to go to other nodes to, to gather the data because all the data is in the same JVM, in the same memory. Everything is in the same server because we use collocation. And that helps us a lot. So we do our nice compute, we get a result, and we send the result back to the client. Here, in terms of communication between the client and the server, there was just 
uh, re request and response. All the rest of the application, all, all the rest of the processing happen in memory on the first server node. Um, there's a talk from uh, Valentin from GridGain. I think he does the same this afternoon. It's about collocation. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. So if you want to know more, uh, that's not the subject of this talk, but I suggest you look at the, the talk proposed here. Uh, but I think he has the same talk this afternoon. So yeah, f end of collocation. Now we're going to look at what we explored. So we decided to look at binary objects. As you might know, uh, when Ignite stores a data in its cache, it stores it in form of a binary object that helps it to be compatible with different type of languages. So you can connect with a .NET application to an Ignite framework where the client has, was a Java client and put data as a Java client. So everything is, form, is uh, stored as binary object. Uh, here, also, since the Ignite nodes, the server nodes were vanilla, we don't have any business model, any model objects on the, the, the server nodes. So any specific jar on there is, is not from us. And with that, when a client connects, it doesn't expect from the, from the cache, it doesn't expect any specific configuration to connect to an Oracle database. So you won't have any problem of class path mismatch between the different nodes of the cluster. You'll see that this indeed only works with binary object because if the object is not in the class path of the server, when you try to read it from the cache, Ignite will deserialize it. And if it doesn't find the class in its class path, it won't work. So you expect you will be the one doing the deserialization. So for instance, if I have an account, what's going to happen is I will get this binary object and I will get the different fields and create an account object out of that. That's potentially about what Ignite does when it has the, uh, uh, this object in the class path. So let's do some demo, some code. Hopefully it's going to work because yeah, everybody knows demo never works. Uh, so we'll have dif different components. We'll have an Ignite cluster. You will see uh, there's no dependency except the Ignite jars in it. Uh, it's just starting the nodes. Then we have this uh, application server that will connect to the cluster using a client node that will start as a Spring Boot application and offer REST endpoints. And also we have this client, as I mentioned, that creates nodes, uh, that creates caches, sorry, and populates data, for instance, for, for our setup. So let me find this one. Uh, so if I look at the, uh, that's, so if I look at here, the, first the POM file, we can see that here in terms of dependencies, we only have Ignite dependencies, nothing specific to our application. And here I have two uh, simple helpful stuff to start the application. Uh, and it's the start of the persistent node, which is, so important thing, we have set the uh, peer class loading to true. Because when you want to be able to send a compute task to the, to the cluster, you need to enable peer class loading. And here we see that we have uh, Ignite uh, native storage uh, enabled. Then, uh, so I have also this upgrade client. This thing just starts a node and then creates a different cache. So we have a customer cache, an account cache here, we see that we have defined upfront the different uh, columns that we can have in our cache. So the cache knows that potentially we can query those using SQL. So here we can have a schema on, scheme on write uh, vision. So we know the, the data that we're going to put in the cache has already this given structure. And so that's the for the, uh, the, the accounts, and we have the same for the transactions. Then I uh, just created a some small script to, to put data in the, in the cache just for the, the sake of the demo. Now I'm going to start the first application. Uh, okay, it's already, it's already started, so let me try to find it. Wait. Wow. So it's not easy to. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So 
So we have the application already running here. It connected to the grid uh, with a client node, and it's offering rest, rest endpoints. So I'm going to quickly test using uh, this application. I'm, post one, I'm going to quickly send some queries. For instance, uh, if I look, I have a customer number uh, zero. If I just send the request, oh, oh, ah, would expect that it's a demo. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> so let me check. Uh, let me restart that one. Wait. Okay. I'll just restart the this one. So yeah, I will restart the client. But normally what happens is I get the list of the accounts uh, that are available for this customer. And I can do different operations. Uh, so let's hope it's working now. Uh, let me try. Yeah. So here we, we see we have the list of different accounts, their balances, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's say I want to look at the transaction that are on a given account. So on the same, nothing, because I haven't put any transaction. So let's create a debit transaction. So here, uh, yeah, we don't see it properly. Oh, yeah, it's up there. So that's my, the, the transaction I'm going to send. I want to remove 1,000 uh, euros, uh, 1,080 euros with this co communication. I just send, and I see that that's the result. It's, it's been created. Uh, if I look at the transactions again, normally, if everything worked, I see the transaction that's been there. And what I can see as well is in the logs, I can see that one server did all the work. You can see that here, the server did the work. It, that's, we saw that it's on the server 2 here, that is server two, that we have a log saying that we created a transaction. Uh, let me go back to presentation mode, it's gonna be better. So here we see that it's the second server that did the job. What I'm gonna do now, say, oh, that's not a nice message, update it takes, oh, okay. I'm gonna change the log message. So here what I'm simulating is, okay, sorry. What I'm simulating here is, okay, I have a new uh, requirement. Uh, oh. Here, that's my new log message. Uh, I hope I can try to, yeah, it's a bit, I don't see everything. Uh, sorry, it's a bit not easy to. So I will restart my application. <coughs> I will restart my application. I will create another transaction, and I will see that without starting, without doing anything on the Ignite grid, I was able to update the code and to really have a new version of the application running without restarting the full grid, without restarting any node at all. So if I send another uh, transaction, let's say, uh, I'm not just going to re remove 20 euros, for instance. So I can see uh, that the transaction went through. And now if I go back to my log, I can see in the log that the message has changed. Instead of having We'll store the transaction here. Uh, I hope you, can you read or? Well, well the, the, the code will be available on GitHub, so you will be able to, to give it a try. But here, we could see that we didn't have to restart the cluster to update the code. So let's go back to our presentation. Well, now we have new requirements. Oh, this business, OK, you've done a very good job. Uh, yeah, we want to do more. So let's say that now the customers, they want to be alerted when, uh, for instance, they 
balance goes under a certain limit. Fine, we are IT guys, we can do that. So we have these requirements. The alert has to be posted if the, uh, the, the balance goes under a given amount. And also, the customer are able to say, OK, this is the amount on which I want to be alerted. So we're going to create a new cache for the new alerts that need to be created. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll add a new field on the existing customer object. And also on the account, we'll add a new field as well, an alert amount. How are we going to do that? We're going to keep the Ignite cluster running. So no restart of the Ignite cluster. We change the model, but we don't restart the Ignite cluster. We're going to use the, uh, migration, the migration application to create the new cache. And everything also, as you see, the compute task is executed on the server, so all the validation is done by the, the server node. And what's going to happen here is that the customer, some of the customer will have a limit. So let's say, oh, I, I heard about this new, uh, new uh, functionalities. I'm going to update my limit. But some people, they won't do that because well, maybe they don't need it. So what's going to happen is every customer that's going to update their limit, their model, their, the, their representation of their object in the, data, in the database, in the cache, will be updated. But some won't be updated. So we will have a discrepancy in terms of objects in the database. And here, the application needs to be able to handle the fact that some customers haven't been migrated, whereas some have. Uh, so we're going to create this alert cache. This is the new object. And those are the different fields that we're going to add on the customer and the account. I said, what we did here, we took the, so we took the first application, we copied it, and we added the new uh, functionality on top of what was existing. So if I go back to this one and go into it's not easy. Uh, so here I have my sec so here I have my client. What I'm going to do is I'm going to execute this create alert cache. It's going to contact the Ignite cluster, say create cache, and exit. Fine, I'm done. All right. So I'm done with this one. And now I'm going to have the second server. The second server is the same as the first one, but we have extra uh, functionality. For instance, on the account, yeah, I wish. Does anyone know the shortcut to enter presentation mode? Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's hard to see, and I can't zoom either. Excuse me? Control command N? F. Yeah, I have a Windows. Uh... Nope. Yeah, but I don't find the menu anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here. OK. So we can see here that the uh, objects taking care of doing the deserialization has been updated. We have to check if there's a field called limit on the binary object. And from this, if it's there, then we create a new object. Otherwise, we can expect it to be null. All right? So let's, for instance, say, Cool, I'm a customer. I want to update my limit. So I'm a customer zero. I want to be warned then when my limit, when my uh, balance goes under 50 euros. I'm going to send that. The last, no, I didn't start the other. Uh, I didn't start the other service, did I? Sorry. So. I'm going to start the second node. And as you might have noticed, I still have the uh, I still have the other node running, right? So I have two different nodes. And then by there, we can simulate two different applications uh, accessing the data. 
Good. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I want to update my limit. Here. OK, we got it. It's fine. So now if I, using the, uh, the new application, if I want to get the different accounts for a given customer, well, I will see a new type of data. We can see that now. Some of the accounts, they don't have a limit. But here, the, uh, the limit on this account has been updated. But what happens for the existing one? I mean, how are they going to deserialize the, application, the, the, the accounts? So if I go back to the first one, well, they don't know about this field. So they don't try to deserialize it. So they don't show the information. So this, the first one is still able to run, to read information from the cache, as long as I, don't, I haven't removed uh, fields that this one was depending on. But here, the application still can read data. So now what I can do is, uh, sorry, I, I can, so I can see that I have uh, 3,400. So I'm going to remove, uh, let's say, 3,000. Uh, 360. So that's on the new server. What's going to happen here normally is I should have seen on my uh, logs because I've put a nice debug. Here, I can see we are under the limit. So what I've done now is we added a, a new requirement. We updated an application, but without restarting the grid. So our grid serving the data is still up. So we didn't, add, we didn't need to restart the application, the, 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 the Ignite grid at any moment when trying to access it and when doing evolution of our application. And here we could have, therefore, different clients with different concerns. One was looking at the old data. It's fine if you needed only the old data. And one was working with the new data. And also, using collocation, I could make sure that all the computation was going on the node where the data was. So if you could, uh, I don't know, I didn't present it properly, but there was, if you really looked at the different logs of the servers, you would see that only one server was working because that was the server that was ho hosting the data for this customer. So the other server didn't have anything to do. And therefore, everything was happening in the same memory space. So we, oh, sorry, really using binary objects and this classless design, we really managed to solve the issue that we had encountered, meaning uh, different application accessing the, the cluster and also not having to restart the cluster when we did a change. However, well, we have some limitations. The one important one is only the application which owns the data should be able to modify it. Because for instance, if I use the first application and try to do a transaction, at some point it saves the account. But since it doesn't know about the limit, it won't try to save the limit. So it will overwrite the data with the former, view, the former, view of the former version of the, uh, the model. So here we lose the information. So we make sure that only the owner of the data should be able to modify it. The other one can query it, but they, only the owner should be able to modify it. Here also, to be able to avoid this problem of uh, cache definition, it works mostly with Ignite Native Persistence because we know that all potentially all the nodes can have the right drivers. Unfortunately, as well, you will have to do the deserialization. So here we had simple objects, but if you have start having very complex object, the reading from a binary object to your model object, it can be uh, tedious. What we've seen works with cache. It doesn't work with uh, Ignite queues or topics, mainly because to do that, you need to use the binary version. So when you get a cache in Ignite, what you have to do, okay, I can quickly show you. Uh, here. What you do here is 
you have the account cache, but you want with keep binary. So that will make sure that when you do a get, you won't get an account. Well, anyway, the, the server node doesn't know about accounts, but you will get a binary object, and you will be the one doing the serialization. Unfortunately, this with keep binary method doesn't exist on queues or topics. But from what I understand on uh, what, how it's implemented behind the scene, I don't think it's a big deal for Ignite or GridGain to implement this. So I guess if we all ask uh, loudly, they, they will do it. And there's a guy over there laughing. <laughs> and finally, when you create the cache, that's where you define the fields that you want to use for your SQL queries. Thing is, once the cache definition has been created and submitted and sent to the, to the cluster, you can't modify it. So here it's very important to understand that when you design your application, try to see as far as possible, to try to collect as many requirements as possible so that you don't have to, at some point, if you really need to use SQL on some fields that you have in your cache, to do some migration, because that's something we want to avoid. So here, you won't be able to query on the new fields. For instance, on the limit fields, I will never be able to do SQL query to check which customers have the limit field or not. So if I want to do a simple select, it's, you can send a compute task to the different nodes saying, execute locally, tell me, go through all your uh, data and tell me once that have or don't have the, the new field. But this is not efficient. So here, this is an important limitation. And here we saw that we have a mix of schema on write and schema on read, because when we created the cache in the beginning, we, ha we would have a schema on write. We have a de comp uh, really a definition of the object that we're going to store. But then, later on, we can have a different vision, a schema on read version, where we actually have another version of what we had stored, an extended one. Right, that was the, the end of it. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any question, I'll be open. Have some time. Yeah. But I, I have a good example. I have a, I have a very good example, actually, and something I, I mean, uh, it's a good thing that you asked because I mentioned to, uh, forgot to mention it. When using collocation, something you have to be very careful with is how your data will be spread around your node. For instance, when you have millions of customers and you have customers that do more transactions than others, with a bit of luck, the data will potentially be evenly spread. But let's say now, for instance, that uh, I want to have the bank as a, as a customer, and the bank receives millions, millions of transactions. Here, if I keep the same model as I had, where I have the, the bank as a customer object and the transaction linked to the account of the bank, the, wherever this bank ob object will be stored, there will be a lot of differences between this node and the other nodes, because this node will have a lot of transactions compared to the other node. And so you will have uh, the problem of the data not being balanced properly. And in this case, because the, that can be dangerous, because if the node goes down, in terms of rebalancing, you come into a hell. So in this case, it's better to not have collocation put in place. So there are a lot of use cases where you don't want to have collocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed. In this, in this case, what I would do is split the transaction in two, a debit and a credit. And that's something that happens quite often. Well, so that's specific to this case. but. Uh, when you do accounting in the bank, at the end, you want to make sure that uh, all the balances are fine. So here you would have a debit and a credit. A debit between 
the customer that has the debit and the bank, and then a credit between the bank and the creditor. So here you would have indeed the transaction collocated with the account. But there are indeed places, moments where you can't do collocation because potentially the data it's collocated with might reside on two different nodes. That definitely can happen. To be honest, this, this was, as I said, this, this talk is based on a workshop, so that's going to be used to try to develop the second version of our shielding application, but we haven't put that into production yet, so we're not there yet. So I can't say for sure. Indeed, the next, I think the next things we're going to have is to make something a bit more stable, a bit more concrete, and definitely uh, put some performance test uh, on the application. That's correct. Is there any way to force it or we just have to be aware of it and be careful? There might be ways to enforce it using uh, Ignite security because in Ignite security you can say that, for instance, uh, you, you can identify clients, so client nodes, and using this you can say, okay, this client node has the right to read but not write. So each application connecting to the cluster, and as here for us, we have security enabled in our clusters because you cannot connect to the cluster without having the right token or the right identification. So each node that will connect to the cluster or to a given cluster group will be given uh, rights, access rights on the cache. And you could say, okay, if you have the node reader because you're not the owner of the application, you can only read the data. So you will get a security exception when trying to modify the data. On the client node, yes. But that, that's... That, like... No, no, but so you have your cluster. So you have your, uh, your Ignite cluster. This one has said, okay, this is my uh, security uh, uh, pattern. Every client node that comes and tries to connect will have to be identified. So it's really on the client node notification. So all, let's say, the cluster belongs to application B, to team B. Every, every application A will have a given token. Say, okay, as, an, as team A, I have this token to connect to the cluster. So I can have 10 different client nodes trying to connect to the cluster. But I have this token application A. And using this token, Ignite will know, okay, this client node won't be able to modify data in the cluster B. Whereas if I'm application B, I have a different token that we'll use to connect to the, to the cluster. And as oh, uh, here we would set the, right, the user rights or the application rights to be able to modify the data. So it's really, um, I would say, non-personal, what we use is non-personal account. So you have uh, a role to, to access. So it's not really on a node, but really on a role that you attribute to a node, that you give to a node. No, it's, it's, everything is done. So it's on the client application, but it's done, on the, cluster, it's done on, the, on the server node. Because you send a compute task to be done on the server node, so the deserialization happens on the server node, and everything stays on the server node and until we get the response. So you haven't seen any performance impact? The, the thing that can happen is the first time you send this compute task, it's going to take time. Because Ignite has to serialize it in some way, make a model tree out of it, send that to the cluster, and be executed. But the second time you send it, if there's no modification, then the execution will happen much, much faster. But that's only for the first call. So what we, we had issues like that before on a different application. And what we did is run, run some warm-up calls, so sending a fake compute task, well, compute task with fake data so that the compute task was sent. And when it was really needed, there was no problem of timeout because the compute task took too much time to sterilize and arrive to the, to, to the server nodes. No, no, we, as I said, this, we still need to run tests. In our application here, in terms of performance, we don't have, we, we're looking at 100 requests per second. It's, it's nothing. So here the goal was not to have something more performant, but something more flexible in terms of cluster availability and team working on the cluster. So it might be slower, but that's, 
something we might want to accept, depending, uh, as I said, we haven't done the test, but something we might want to accept regarding the gain that we get, that the cluster is always up and that many teams can work on the cluster. That's correct. Well, uh, for instance, for the accounts, we use the Ignite SQL. So we have this, uh, uh, I don't have access to the presentation anymore, but when, you, when to, lead, to get the list of the accounts, what we did is we run a SQL using select accounts where owner ID is the one that we get as an input of the rest endpoint. But again, SQL is nice. But in my opinion, it's, it's not what we should aim for when using Ignite. Ignite is really caches, uh, using informational caches, get and put. It's nice to have SQL, but for instance, right now, I was told that it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be updated soon. But when you have a transaction, for instance, SQL doesn't participate to the transaction. And then how do you do like, uh, That's the thing. That, as I presented yesterday, when using that kind of patterns, you need to change your model drastically need to make sure that the model corresponds to the framework. It's like any platform of framework, I think. Uh, if you use it for something it wasn't designed for, you will have issues. So you have to understand really how they, what they, what they thought about when they created the, uh, the framework, the application, and try to use it as it is. And don't use it for something it wasn't done for. Yeah. You could, I have to check, because um, the thing is I use to get and put, uh, put to put the object. So when you do a put, it overrides the whole object. Potentially you can, I have to double check, but you might run a, a task, you, to, you send a, a task to be executed on the object in the cache it's uh, execute or something like that. Well, you might be able to do that, but I haven't looked into, into this possibility. Potentially, yeah. But for, this, for the sake of this presentation, it was the master. But potentially, uh, when you have the, the mainframe behind the scene, then it depends on the mainframe because we have application where the mainframe sends the, uh, the mutation back to the grid. So we have a Kafka uh, topic. And each time there's something change in the mainframe, the mainframe sends the, the, the mutation. And what happens here is like, we don't modify the cache, we send directly to the mainframe, and the mainframe sends the, the, the mutation, and then we update the, the cache. So after the big start, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the but the goal here is to really, uh, if it's not the, the source of data, it's, it's not the, the, the source of record, is to have um, really a copy of what's existing in the mainframe until we can replace the mainframe with more modern technology that are more adapted to the needs. Well, the, what's important to understand is what you're gonna do with the data. Uh, for instance, here for us, we wanted to get the, the transaction. Uh, we wanted to, uh, so, so that's really to be able to read quickly the transaction that are related to an account. So when we did get all accounts for, get all transactions for a given account, we don't want to run a select on the whole cluster. So here it was really about the business, how do you want to use your data? For instance, if I, had, if I go back to this compute task to calculate the average amount on uh, the accounts, that's because, so here I want to have all the information on the same place. So here you should design collocation in terms of how you're gonna process the information. If you see that, for instance, you have contracts, but those contracts will never be processed together for whatever reason, there's no need to collocate them.
But <coughs> so yeah, here in that case, indeed, you will have to check which one is going to be used the most, indeed. So because you can't collocate by branch and by, by, uh, by customer, for instance. So if you have this requirement, potentially, you have different ways of solving it. First, say, OK, it's something that's done every once, once a day or something like that, so I can afford scanning my whole cluster. It's something that's done every millisecond. It's more important than the other one, then I will collocate by branch, and so on and so forth. So it really depends on, on your use case, really. How, how important, how speed important is? Is it very important there, or it's OK? Can I afford to scan my cluster or not? So that's the, really the, the, the questions you have to ask yourself. That, where don't, it's not us who choose to store the data in binary format. Ignite stores that. So in terms of, doesn't change anything. Here we, we never store data in Java, even if you use normal uh, other ways to do it, where you have the model which is deployed on the, on the node, it will be stored as a binary. That's Ignite that decides that for you. So there's no change here. There's, there's really no change. You can't force Ignite to store it as a Java object. It will always be stored as a binary object. No, but here you don't have a choice. So the data is stored as binary so that it can be used by .NET applications, for instance, and they don't know about Java. Right? Thanks a lot, and yeah, have a nice lunch.